men or they don't like this, they don't like that. What the key to having great horses is if you're impatient or you're abusive and you have horses, you are going to have impatient, abusive horses. That's all there is to it. Your horses are a 100 per Your horses personalities are basically a full on mirror image of you. So if you're a dick and you have horses, your horses are going to be dicks. If you are warm and affectionate to these things, as you can see, that's what you're going to get back. All right? So if you're scared and nervous, your horse is going to be scared and nervous. All right, mums? Oops, sorry. Right in the eye. My horses have never, ever, ever lashed out physically at a human being. Ever, ever. And they never, ever will. You can do whatever you want to these horses, as long as it's not abusive. And they will let you. They all come to me. They don't avoid me. And they all know that it feels good when I come near them. And that is the key. I just gotta get that last one. Hold on. Let me get it. Come on, get me here. She's doing pretty good. I don't really she can't stand her bangs being brushed at all. Maybe she knows she's on the camera. I don't know. There you go. There you go. There you go. Got it. Good girl. So anyway, uh this one time years ago, I was working for this outfit who had basically no experienced hands and they sent four of us off into the mountains with a pack string of about 18 horses. The guy that they put in charge, he was typically, you know, one of those guys, you know, those people that um, they kiss ass to climb that invisible ladder that leads nowhere when it comes to businesses and employment sometimes. He's one of those guys, did a good job of it because um, he hadn't been there a week. I'd been there with two other guys over a month. He didn't even know how to tie a frickin' diamond, which is the last rope goes around the pack boxes. And he comes out with a note from the outfitter saying that he's in charge. <laughs> he's camp boss. <laughs> I was like, what? You gotta be kidding me. This ought to be good. So anyway, all I'm saying, mentioning that is, is I got no say in anything. I'm just there to do the best I can, but I have no word in, in whatever. And this guy's ego was so fragile and he knew he was outclassed by a couple of us. He would rather let things spiral loose than make them better by admitting he may not have the knowledge or be able to do as good of a job or ask for a better way to do it or ask to be shown how to do it properly. It was a real, it was a real shit show and uh, it was unfortunate. But anyways, getting, along, getting on with the story. So here we go. Uh, when you are packing, you'll have one guy tying the knot and one person on our side of the horse cinching the load. So the guy tying the knot, pull, you just pull that, pull the slack, and they'll pull up the other side of the horse, pull, 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 until you finally get that lash rope tight, and then they'll say, good enough, and they'll tie up. So I'm packing with this one doorknob who is apparently a 10-year guy. I got more stories about him later. They're freaking hilarious. And he's one of these guys where you shake his hand, it's like shaking a freaking dead mannequin's hand. There's nothing there. It's like really creepy. This is clammy, loose, no grip. <laughs> this is real creepy. And he, he tied the diamond knot the same way. He'd be like, pull, 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 good enough. I'd be, what? This thing isn't even freaking tight. I gotta do it. It's not even tight enough. It's good enough. Okay. So that's how the packing went with our horses, and then the other horses were getting packed by these other ding-dongs who'd never even frickin' been to British Columbia before. <laughs> so you can imagine where this is going. So anyway, but what I, I'll skip the, the packing nightmare and the wreck nightmare, but what was supposed to be about an eight hour, it was supposed to be a seven to nine hour ride out to this outpost camp, turned into a day and three quarters, and about eight wrecks, and a wreck is when all the horses blow up and explode and pack boxes fly everywhere and you gotta find everybody to repack everybody. It's just a frickin' nightmare. Slept on the ground under some trees and shit, caught horses, found horses, and it was just absolutely hell. So anyways, once we get up to this high mountain pass, there's a scooped out basin. Like the basin goes down in front of us. The trail is basically a game trail and goes along. This trail goes across this basin face. And we're just above tree line. Ah, mixed in trees. 
We're just in this, you know, that stunted spruce, patch of stunted spruce around us, you had poplar, the willow. And the game trail is about this wide. It was flat. There's obviously the horses have used it before. So what these ding-dongs did, they had this huge percheron mare, which is just a big, massive chunk of meat. <laughs> she was a good horse, but she was huge. And she pulled back. So pull, pull back is meaning they'll, they'll uh, <coughs> pull back on the lead rope to the point they'll go, they'll go way back on the, on the rears and then jerk forward once they finally do kick forward. And uh, typically a horse like that is a nightmare to lead from your saddle horse because you got a percher on that pulls back and you're gonna lead it. If you ever stop and go to start going, she goes, Arr! basically jerks your freaking arm out of your socket because you're not gonna move that horse. And you drop the lead rope and you gotta get up. You gotta get the lead rope, get back on your horse and try to coax that horse into moving again. But once this big chunk of meat started moving, she'd move, but if she stopped and then you want her to start moving again, she'd jerk back first. Arr, 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 arr right so if you had any horse experience at all that particular mare you would cut her loose and let her run free just put her lead rope around her neck tie a bowl in it so it doesn't choke her strangle her up and she will follow and go with the flow with everybody instead of creating a big fight so what do these guys do they put her behind these two freaking little sorrel saddle horses and uh which are probably like maybe three quarters the size of her, maybe. And she's loaded, up. everybody's loaded up. So these two horses have got pack boxes on. She's got pack boxes on. These guys demand that we head and tail tie them, which is absolute insanity because once you get going, we always, always cut everybody loose. It's, it's no grief, it's no nightmare. If you have somebody like my mare here, who half the herd's in love with, well, you lead her by herself. She's a great horse and everybody's gonna go where she goes. You're not gonna have any problems. And furthermore, if the horse has already been out to that camp, they know the program. They know where we're going. They're going there. The only time you might have serious problems if you cut them loose is if you have some new horses that haven't mixed in with this herd and they've never been there. You cut them loose, they'll be like, I don't like these guys, I don't like you, we're out of here. And they'll book it down the wrong valley and then you gotta catch all the horses, tie them up and then <laughs> try to catch those other horses and find them and bring them back and it's just time consuming and a nightmare. So, uh, but getting back towards the insanity of just how tough a horse can be, um, these ding-dongs insisted on tying this big percher on to the tail of this, basically it's just a small saddle horse, two of them in front of her, being led by this kid from Saskatchewan. And uh, we all finally got up to the top of this this pass everybody stopped and we got to get going across this trail and it's like this i mean it is straight freaking down on the downhill side of this this basin on this goat trail <clears throat> so this kid is leading the two the three tied up so you got this horse you know no bigger than macaroni no smaller than macaroni two of them smaller than macaroni and this great big tank of a frickin' slug of a chunk of meat horse, percher and mare, tied on the tail, the, the rear one. So I'm off my horse and I know I gotta get this mare going so he hasn't any problems. So off they go. I said, once you start going around, going across that basin, do not stop. At all costs, do not stop, all right? Just think about it. If he's going across that trail, which is basically a cliff down to the right, and if he stops, sitting on his horse and goes to go ahead again, she's gonna jerk back and jerk those horses right off the cliff. So sure enough, this kid starts riding across the goat trail, going across that goat trail through that basin face. Somebody back behind me down the trail yelled something, not at him, this yelled up from over the edge, yelled up to us. The kid's halfway across the trail and he stops dead and goes, what? I'm like, oh my God, don't stop. And right away he looks at me and goes, oh shit. And then he goes to get going and that, that perch on mirror goes like this. Arr! Just like that. Jerks those two horses straight backwards like they weigh 10 pounds each. Rips, obviously rips the lead rope out of that kid's hand like it's butter, of course. Jerks them back, jerks them back. They're stumbling backwards. Over they go to the edge. She's tied onto them. Over she goes over the cliff. All three of these horses are tied together and they are literally cartwheeling in a big ball of hooves pack boxes and gear 
and weird squeaky horse sounds coming out of them and they're going like this poof, poof, poof. straight down the side of that freaking mountain is one of the most insane nastiest things i've ever seen witness firsthand in horse world and once they disappeared over this you know we couldn't see anymore you could still see the trees the 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 spruce treetops going like this, boom, 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 boom. So all three of these horses the pack boxes have disappeared over the bank. They've, they've, they're literally flying down the cliff, cartwheeling in a big ball of hooves and meat in the pack boxes. It was a very, very, very uh, stressful, violent scene. It was unbelievable. And then uh, once they disappeared out of sight, they're still literally, they're literally airborne. That I've seen them, all of them, literally airborne a couple times as they were spinning and bouncing down the mountain. And then they finally uh, were out of sight, but you could still see the treetops. The treetops bouncing, getting mowed over as they were still wailing down through the brush. And then finally stopped. And then uh, that kid is sitting on his horse, and he's sitting on his horse and literally starts screaming, crying. He's physically crying and screaming. Which for me, I don't give a shit how many of you guys say I talk like a tough guy or something. It's not talking like a tough guy, it's just saying it the way it is. If you are going to be in the Rocky Mountains guiding for anything, it's up to you to be able to do anything. There isn't anything up there that you can't do. And I always stress that to all the young bucks who want to come up and do this for a living. First off, if you have it in you to scream for your mommy for help, this isn't the job or the place for you because there's nobody there to help you you have to be able to do everything and anything at any time there's nobody there to save your ass nobody there's no giving up there's no saying i've had enough there just isn't that's the world that it is okay so when i see somebody taking on that job and acting like that oh my god i just want to kick the freaking ass so anyway uh so this kid's sitting there screaming crying help He's sitting on his horse screaming help and uh screw him I, I went and got my horse so the ho I'm sitting on a horse so I jumped up my horse tied my horse up uh, tied up my pack string grabbed a knife and I just started sliding down that bank and following the trail of shrapnel that they left broken branches and shit and it's just the most nastiest feeling it's disgusting because you you know you imagine the the destruction the broken bones and the death and everything you're expecting to see by the time you find these poor things and uh, I finally found them. I just like pack, you know, we had pack boxes full of grain and all sorts of stuff. And it's just a trail of grain stuck in the slope all the way down and, and uh, some gear. And I uh, get down there and they're wedged up against a ball of stunted spruce on an angle like this. The ground's like that. And they are stacked on top of each other, tangled up. There's legs sticking everywhere. Uh, you can see all the gear really cutting into them. Like not you know, like not flesh cut, but you could just see it like, you know, like really tight on their bodies. But, you know, all the rigging was just really cinched tight on their bodies. They're tang just a big tangled up frickin' mess of pack rigging and horse flesh. And everybody's, and you can just see them going like this, like, <sighs> you just hear the labored breathing and you don't know what's broken, there's blood. So I'm just looking at it, it's like a puzzle. I just started seeing the most messed up chunk of rigging. I cut it, kind of stand back a little bit, cut another piece, boom, a horse stands up. Stands up, no broken bones, bloody nose and shit. And I'm like, no way, oh my God. By the time I got one horse up, that kid had made his way down. So I said, take this horse and traverse your way back and get that horse back up there. <laughs> and off they go. I got two more sitting there piled up still. I'm like, okay, one of these got to be dead, for God's sake, something's got to be broken. And same thing, I'm getting my knife and I'm yarding on things, pulling on feet and legs and pulling on heads. Boom, I've got two horses up, standing, no broken bones. How freaking amazing is that? And then uh, another dude came down, gave him that horse, find your way back up. And then, uh, and then the third horse got up and no broken bones, started eating grass. Now I know that story sounds a little, it might not sound that exciting, but if you could picture it, you can picture three horses tied to each other, cartwheeling through the air in a big tangled up ball, straight down the side of a mountain, mowing over trees. That was ab absolute alarming, upsetting, stressful scene and experience to go through. Don't, I 
definitely don't want to see that again. I haven't since, but uh, it was 100% the fault of the so-called cowboys there. 100% human caused from human error and lack of knowledge and experience and ego from the guy who was apparently in charge. It was big time, big time there, 100% their fault. I was raging on fire, pissed off. And, uh, but amazingly, not a broken frickin' bone. Just goes to show you just how frickin' tough a horse can be. You know, meanwhile, you see a horse going down some stupid course on TV and snap, they snapped a frickin' leg in half. <laughs> you know, it's kind of weird. But anyway, and then we had to uh, pack up all those pack boxes, the pack saddles, and drag them, pack them up, up the mountain by hand, and then try to lash stuff together and repair stuff there with string and shit, and, uh, and off we went and carried on, and we made it to our destination finally. But there you go. How is that for a frickin' story of an absolute nightmare scene experience with mountain horses in the middle of frickin' nowhere? Never in my life would I have ever dreamt I would see uh, three horses tied in a big tight ball tangled up flying through the frickin' air down the side of a mountain. Frickin' crazy. Hey, Mons. Hey. Yeah, so this is Mums. She's frickin' awesome. She's one of the best horses in the planet. She's beautiful. And uh, she loves affection. <laughs> Don't you? Hey. Hey, Mums. Now this is my baby boy, hey? That is my baby boy. Hmm? Who's your daddy? Hey, my boy, who's your daddy? Hmm? Who's your dad? That's me. I decided to give you life. Hmm? And uh, he is a purebred Canadian gelding. I should've, should've kept him a stud. And uh, he's absolutely awesome. Oh, well, mom's over there is his mom. And he has been in the middle of frickin' nowhere. <laughs> He's been on a few hunting trips with us. And he definitely liked it. He wants to go again. Look at these frickin' burrs. Gosh. And uh, I think I'll show you some pictures of him here when he was a tiny little, when he's a baby boy. I don't know if any of you have ever made a horse before, but I'll tell you what. Having a horse born, a baby horse born, outside your frickin' bedroom window is something else. And I swear, you know, you horse people know what I'm talking about. It would be easy to do that every single year. It's an amazing experience. It's absolutely amazing making you, making a horse. It was so frickin' cool, it's stupid. And obviously you get a special bond with them like I do. And it's lifelong, and you can't escape it. <laughs> All right? Look at this shit. Got to get it out. All right? Yeah, so he was absolutely stunning. Jet black. A little bit of a white star in his forehead. Basically, the planet stopped spinning for a minute when he first came out. All the horses in the neighborhood and all the farm animals, everything was just standing there staring over their fences a long ways away towards my place. When I woke up, I looked out the window and saw that. And it was automatic. I just knew. It's like, uh oh, he's here. The baby is here. Yes, it is. Sure enough, he went out the other. And uh, <laughs> there he was. <laughs> there he was. There he was. This brand new little thing. It was four legs and a head. Hey. Anybody? No. Okay. And uh, he's been my baby boy ever since, so I call him little boy. He's a little man, little boy. You should call him little boy. Hey, little boy. Huh? Same deal. You can see how they react to me. You treat your horses with love and affection, and that is, that's what you get back. Now this, this is Mr. Macaroni. Mr. Macaroni is, is solid, without a doubt, my best friend on the whole planet. And he has been for many years. Hey, buddy. I don't know. How long have we been best friends for now? 13 years or something, maybe? Hmm? 12 or 13 years? What do you think? And um, his story, our story, uh, 
I bought you for seven hundred dollars. <laughs> he was a late three-year-old. Hey, get your butt over. Get your butt over. Come on. Get your butt over. I bought him for seven hundred bucks. Up north, he was originally bred just north of Fort St. John to be an outfitter horse. And uh, he, uh, I bought a couple of them. And by the time I got him down to me down here uh, to hang out with me and, and to learn, he was absolutely freaking terrified of me, of humans. Absolutely terrified. And uh, it was like, like he was a, like he was a bait fish and I was a shark. He would not let me near him at all costs and would freaking freak and gallop away. And, uh, but I kept my patience because obviously, you know, if you have no patience, <laughs> that's, that's the horse you're going to get. You're going to have an impatient horse if you have impatience. So, uh, but the weirdest thing, it was like, it was like all of a sudden, uh, overnight, I, I got up in the morning, went to the, I went out in the pasture, and uh, Macaroni, he's a red roan, and his name is perfect, Macaroni. Macaroni comes walking up to me after being absolutely terrified of me for, you know, a couple weeks. He comes walking up to me, basically puts his head in my lap just like this, and, uh, and let me touch him everywhere, and he, if I walked anywhere, he walked with me. He stuck to me like freaking glue. It was the most bizarre, crazy, awesome experience, but uh, that was it. Like, bang. And it was like an angel in the night told him that I was his best friend and best thing in the whole world. And he went, oh, really? Oh, okay. And uh, the very next morning, he came up to me, put his head in my lap, and stuck to me like frickin' Velcro. And he always has. Always. Um, I've ridden him with just a halter on like this and a lead rope in my hand. That's it. Never needed anything more. Um, He's absolutely affectionate. Every time I say his name, he yells back at me. He's never done a mean thing to anybody or any other horse in his lifetime. He's absolutely awesome. And uh, here's another funny one. Oh yeah, so like, you know, when I first, I'm the only person that's ever ridden him. Like when I first got on his back outside of the round pen, he never bucked me off ever. Uh, I got on him first time we were in the wide open pasture and I got on him and he started crow hopping a bit. And I didn't have my other foot, my far foot in the stirrup yet. So I fell off. It wasn't, it's not an official buck. He didn't officially buck me off. I just kind of fell off. And then uh, he just stood there looking at me like, what are you doing down there? <laughs> I got up off the ground, climbed back on him. And we went galloping and rippering all over the frickin' place. And it was absolutely fine. It's so bizarre. So awesome. And then, uh, and then another time we were going to, uh, finally put pack boxes on him and see what he thought of that before the fall heading up north for a few months so we made a big curtain we made these two big curtains for him to push through of big green alder branches with a veil of green branches hanging down and we hung one in the fence like a big veiling curtain and we got another guy to hold another curtain the other side to make sure it bonked his pack boxes and then I let him through and uh, we smashed his box into the trees and you expect him to blow up we were expecting him to blow up we put the pack boxes on his body didn't do a thing. He's like, whatever, I'm ready. I know what we're doing. And then we pushed him through these trees and blazed the boxes with him. Bonk, bonk. And he's like, oh, crazy. And then he turned around and he put his head down. And he smashes through the branches as in knowing to push them out of the way with the boxes on them. <laughs> and then I'm like, what? No way. So then uh, I tied the lead rope around his neck, put a bowl in it so it'd strangle him and cut him loose to go run around the pasture and and bonk the boxes off of things and see if it'll make them start bucking. And nope, he, uh, there was a horse trailer in the pasture, the door open, he freaking goes up the horse trailer, <laughs> dives in head first, and goes up to the front of the horse trailer with the pack boxes on and looks back at me like, are we going? I wanna go hunting. I'm like, you just went from $700 to $3,500 just like that. <laughs> but I'd never sell them. And uh, <laughs> what are you doing? So there you go. That's mess. That's Mr. Macaroni. He's tried to come onto the porch and have beers with us when everybody's been over having a beer on the porch. He's come up on the porch to try to come in the house, <laughs> and uh, I think he thinks he's more uh, my dog, and then he does think he's a horse. <laughs> he's pretty freaking cool. Hey, buddy. Hey, my little man. They're all really cool, actually. You can see they're very, very affectionate horses, and there's only one reason, and that's because they are treated with affection and respect and patience.
And that's what you get back. Right, buddy? Yeah. So there you go. Horses are a lot tougher than we think. There, there you go. Horses are definitely a lot tougher than one would think on average. And um, just make sure if you are in horse world and you have horses or you want to get horses, make sure you treat them with respect and patience. And don't dominate the living shit out of them and control them. And uh, you will have a good horse in return.